Hello and welcome to the Museum of Flight here in Seattle, which is one of the most incredible aviation museums in North America. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a guided tour of this entire place. Again, it's going to be a very long video, so if there's a particular aircraft you're looking for, then I'll mention it in timestamps down below. But otherwise, sit back and enjoy the show. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes and sometimes music. And more music. These videos include reviews of flights around the world and guided tours through significant aircraft in museums. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. Starting right out the front is this 1954 Lockheed 1049G Super Constellation, which was the upgraded version of the standard Constellation which revolutionised civil aviation. While these were not the first pressurised airliners, and check out my Smithsonian tour for that aircraft, but this was the first mass-produced pressurised airliner, therefore the vast majority of the world would have seen this first. One particular design characteristic was the triple tail, which looks beautiful but was also practical. Because the aircraft was not a tail dragger like many others from that era, such as the DC-3, the whole tail end was much higher. So to avoid having such a tall vertical fin that would stop it from fitting inside hangars, they essentially divided the fin into three and lined them up next to each other. Also by putting the fins directly behind the props, that improved their authority as well. It's a fascinating design and I hope you check out my footage of the last remaining Super Connie in Australia flying, which I'll link to below. Now let's head inside and continue the tour. This here is a reproduction of the 1903 Wright Flyer, which was the first airplane to achieve manned, powered, sustained, controlled and heavier than air flight. While this only covered 120 feet or 36 meters, it started an incredible revolution. One of the most interesting design features was the forward section which includes the elevator for pitch control. On almost all modern aircraft following it, this section was moved to the tail. This was powered by a single 12 horsepower 201 cubic inch 4 cylinder engine which made use of aluminium which was lighter but they painted it black to hide that fact from potential competitors. Moving well forward in history and we have the Boeing Model 40B reproduction. This design first flew in 1925 and was operated primarily as a mail plane. 80 of these were built and it was the first Boeing aircraft designed to carry paying passengers as well. Earlier models of this were built with wood and steel fuselages, but further advances with arc welding resulted in later models being made entirely of welded steel tubing. Flying mail was faster than trains as long as they could keep flying at night, just like a train could continue to travel, so they installed these beacons all throughout the country to help guide the planes towards their destination at night. Prior to these, they used car headlights and bonfires which wasn't ideal especially in the rain. Moving forward is the Boeing Model 80A1, and this is the only surviving example anywhere in the world. This first flew in 1928 and up until this, planes were mostly designed to fly mail, but this was designed primarily to fly passengers. In contrast with the Model 40 we just looked at, this had a heated cabin, leather seats, reading lights, a toilet and running water on board. Having said that, the lack of pressurisation meant that it would fly along at low altitudes so the ride would have been pretty rough and the noise from the three Pratt & Whitney Hornets would have been deafening for the 18 passengers. While it was traditionally the co-pilot's job to look after the passengers, Boeing Air Transport employed female cabin attendants for their Model 80 flights, introducing the idea of flight attendants. They were all unmarried registered nurses as motion sickness was a common problem on these flights. Competitors to this aircraft were the Ford and Fokker Tri-Motors, although this was the only biplane which gave it good low speed performance which was important on rural runways. Only 16 of these were built before being replaced by the all-metal Boeing 247 which you'll see later in this video. Now we'll go and have a look at this Boeing Model 100 which was a civilian version of the Army P-12 and Navy F-4B fighters. 586 of these were built and they were one of the primary frontline fighters for the US in the 1930s. They were a mix of the old and new designs with cloth coverings, although aluminium was used on the ailerons and tail surfaces. 
later versions had an entirely aluminium skin. This is the Stearman C-3B biplane which first flew in 1927. This example has one fitted but the original models didn't have tail wheels and instead had skids. Most airfields were just grass and dirt therefore the plane could land wherever it wanted to, stop to unload and then take off into whichever direction the wind was coming from. They did not have brakes so these skids were helpful in slowing the plane and on takeoff the tower would lift up off the ground anyway once they gained any speed. Next is the Curtis Robin C1 which was designed primarily for private buyers and was popular due to the large enclosed cabin. They were designed to use surplus OX5 engines from World War I but later upgraded to use more modern engines. This example was owned by a newspaper and flew 380 miles per day to deliver 5,000 newspapers to 40 towns and they would be dropped through a hole in the fuselage. This is a Stinson Model Zero reproduction and was a military trainer aircraft that first flew in 1933 although only 33 were made. Next we have the Lockheed Model 10E Electra that first flew in 1934 and designed to compete with the Boeing 247 and Douglas DC-2, both of whom you'll see later. On October 1934, the US government banned single aircraft from flying passengers or at night, which made this quite a desirable aircraft for smaller airlines. It was also made famous as it was flown by Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan in their ill-fated expedition in 1937. This example is one of 149 built and this was flown by Northwest Airlines. Next is the jet that terrified the West, it's the McCoy and Gurevich MiG-15. This first flew in 1947 and was the first jet fighter to incorporate the swept wing design discovered from early German work from World War II. This was considerably faster than the American jets of the time such as the F-80 and it resulted in the rushed development of the North American F-86 Sabre. Next to it is Canada's modified version of the F-86, the CL-13B, built under license and this Mark VI model was powered by the Avro Canada Orendo Mark 14 turbojet engine. These were also made in Australia but re-engined with bigger and more powerful Rolls-Royce Avons which, like the P-51, perfected the American design with a British engine. Next is the Vought XF 80U1 Crusader and this is the actual first prototype. It's a single engine, supersonic, carrier based air superiority jet and first flew in 1955. An interesting design feature was the variable incidence wing which you can see here with the wing's leading edge lifted up above the fuselage. This allowed for greater low speed lift which was ideal for aircraft carrier landings and takeoffs. It was also the first American jet fighter to reach 1000 miles per hour and after they were retired by the US Navy in 1976, NASA used them during testing for the digital flyby wire and supercritical wing designs. It's also considered to be the last of the gunfighters as this was the last jet where its primary weapons were guns as later aircraft planned to use missiles. This blue jet up here is a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter which was America's first operational Mac 2 fighter. This one has been painted to look like NASA's F-104A. Next to it is a Northrop YF-5A which was a low cost supersonic fighter. The production version had two 20mm cannons, rockets, missiles and 5,500 pounds of external bombs. Now this is interesting as it's the only place in the world where you can sit inside a real SR-71. This came from an aircraft that crashed in 1968 due to a landing gear failure during takeoff. The crew escaped unharmed but the plane itself was scrapped so the museum was able to get a hold of this. Next to it is the MiG-21 which first flew in 1955 and was an incredibly successful fighter and interceptor for over 60 countries. It's very simple to maintain and operate, thin and an agile fighter in stark contrast with the next jet, the McDonald F-4C Phantom II. The latter has two large and powerful engines which allowed it to carry a huge bomb load, making it highly versatile. One amusing story from the development was the discovery of lateral instability during wind tunnel testing. 
To fix this, they had to angle the wings up a little, but to avoid redesigning the whole thing so late in the development, they simply angled up the winglets and the problem was fixed. Now next to it is not an SR-71, but in fact the only remaining Lockheed M-21 Blackbird anywhere in the world. M stands for Mothership, and if you look at it from this angle, you'll notice a D-21 drone attached above the fuselage between the two engines. This was a high-speed reconnaissance drone powered by a ramjet, and the idea was that these would be launched from the M-21 at high speed, fly over enemy territory, and then eject the footage and self-destruct. I show you one of these D-21 drones up close in my guided tour around the Air Force Museum in Dayton. After a fatal accident where the other M-21 crashed, this was modified to be launched from a B-52 Stratofortress where it was attached to the secondary jet to get it up to speed so that the ramjet could then operate. Several of these flights were made with some success, although the program was cancelled in 1971 after 38 of these drones were made. Moving up these stairs next to this Boeing 737, we have an AGM-86B air-launched cruise missile. These were launched from B-52s or B-1Bs and can carry either nuclear or conventional warheads over 1,500 miles. It flies low to avoid radar and powered by a turbofan jet engine. This is a Lockheed or Boeing RQ-3A Dark Star stealthy drone. These were designed to fly at high altitude and collect radar and optical data which could then be sent immediately back to HQ, but the program was cancelled, that we know of, in 1999. There's a German V1 flying bomb, and in front of that is a Scan Eagle portable observer. This actual drone was used in the rescue of Captain Richard Phillips from the ship MV Maersk Alabama off the coast of Somalia, and there was a Tom Hanks film based on this story. Now the next bit was closed due to a function, so let's move back downstairs. This red object is a Taylor Era Car 3 and one of the first flying cars. This is one of six examples that first came into being from 1949 and was registered to both fly and drive on public roads. It was powered by a flat four cylinder engine producing 143 horsepower, which could either connect to the front wheels via a three speed manual or to the propellers at the tail. It could either tow its wings and tail like a trailer or leave them at the airport, and it could carry a single passenger. Apparently it flew well, but it was not a commercial success. Let's walk across the T. Evans Wyckoff Memorial Bridge and check out the Aviation Pavilion. By the way, if you enjoy these videos, then please give it a thumbs up and comment below. By doing so, it lets me know that I should keep making these types of videos and encourages YouTube to share them. Now I intentionally avoid paid product placements where I spend 60 seconds telling you to buy something that I'm paid to say is amazing, so please support my channel with a simple thumbs up, make sure you're subscribed and maybe even tell a friend about these videos. Now back to the tour. First up here we have the Boeing B-17F Flying Fortress Heavy Bomber that first flew in 1935. Over 12,000 of these were built and it operated mostly in the European theatre of operations and dropped more bombs than any other aircraft during World War II. But it almost never happened as the prototype crashed during a demonstration flight, although the US Army Air Force was so impressed with the specifications on paper that they ordered it anyway. It was unpressurised, so the crew were exposed to extremely cold temperatures, just adding to the incredible bravery they displayed. Now they could wear jackets with electrical currents through them to generate some heat, but then their sweat could cause these to short and give them a shock. It really would have been an awful experience flying on board these during the war. I crawl inside one of these and the B-29 in a separate video, so I'll link to those in the video description below. Next is a bomber that replaced it, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. This was the single most expensive project during World War II, even more than the Manhattan Project, and this bomber really was advanced for its time. It had a tricycle undercarriage providing superior handling on the ground and it had an advanced remote turret system where a single operator could control multiple different turrets and fire at the same target. 
in the B-17 you saw earlier, a man would physically sit inside each turret while this is all done remotely by someone sitting in relative comfort. Another advance was cabin pressurization, where air was bled from the engine, producing both heat and pressure inside the cabin, thus making it far more comfortable for the crew. Once in the combat zone, they would actually depressurize the aircraft so that a sudden pressure differential would be lessened if the cabin skin was compromised by flak or a stray bullet. Then out of harm's way, they would repressurize the cabin, assuming that there were no holes to allow the air to leak out of. This was the type that dropped both atomic bombs on Japan, and those two aircraft are on display and featured in my Smithsonian and US Air Force videos in Dayton, and I'll link to them below. Then moving into the jet age, we have the Boeing WB-47E. This was a modified B-47E, which was a high-speed, high-altitude bomber powered by six turbojets and served in the Strategic Air Command during the 1950s and 60s as the nuclear deterrent. Over 2,000 of these innovative jets were built, and this one was converted into a weather reconnaissance aircraft, where it would sniff about, searching for evidence of foreign nuclear explosions. Positioning the engines in the pods under the wings was novel for the time, as opposed to integrating them into the wing, and this allowed for ease of maintenance, and for the wing to be much thinner and slipperier, thus allowing higher speeds. This also had a bicycle landing gear, allowing it to keep space free for the massive bomb bay, and also avoid placing the wheels under the wing, as we see with the B-29, because this would again require much stronger, heavier, and thicker wings. Now I should clarify that this does have small outrigger wheels attached to the inboard engine pods, but these were mostly for stability on the ground and to support the wings, and therefore not especially strong or heavy. It's been removed from this example, but they also came with JATO, which stands for Jet Assisted Takeoff rockets attached to the fuselage, which gave them extra power to take off with the heavy fuel and bomb load. Next we briefly look at this Boeing 787 Dreamliner prototype. This first flew in 2009, and over 1,000 have been built, and it has a perfect safety record with zero losses. Now I'll show you inside this in another video. Next, we have the first Boeing 737 prototype that is now painted in NASA colors, as it was used for their research after Boeing had finished their testing program. This became one of the most successful commercial airliners in the world, and is nicknamed the Baby Boeing because of its small size. In fact, this 100 model wasn't overly popular and was quickly stretched as the airlines wanted a larger cabin for more passengers. Many may not realize this, but it shares the same nose design with the 707 and 727. In fact, if you look at a 737 MAX and the 707 noses, you'll realize that they're almost identical. I guess there was no need to change something if it was already working well and it would save some money. It is also interesting that the cabin is the same size as the Boeing 787 engine, thus showing how larger modern turbofans have become. While the 737 came with two turbojet engines positioned under the wings, early design proposals actually had two rear-mounted engines, as they would allow for a lower fuselage and the engines would be kept up and away from foreign bodies found on remote runways. Remember that this was designed to operate out of small regional airports. But in the end, it was easy to maintain them if they were positioned under the wing and they could use a much lighter tail design, which would need such heavy reinforcements if the engines were attached there. But this has become a problem with the MAX, where the engines are now so much larger that they had to lift them well forward of the wing so that they could fit underneath it, but also have enough ground clearance. The 737 first flew in 1967, and two years after that, this actual aircraft, the first Boeing 747 prototype, took to the skies. Seeing it next to the 737, 727 and 707 that you'll see shortly, really highlights how massive it was. While we're used to seeing big jets these days, you can really understand why some people back then thought that it just would not get off the ground. It was powered by four Pratt & Whitney JT-9D turbofans, and at the time, they were stressed as far as possible to generate enough thrust. In fact, they had major problems with them during the developmental process, and 30 747s were built and put into storage with concrete blocks hanging from the wings, while Boeing and Pratt & Whitney desperately worked together to fix the problems. In the end, they discovered that the engine casing was deforming into an oval during takeoff thrust, which resulted in the turbine blades rubbing against them, causing everything to disintegrate. 
This was fixed by strengthening the casing, and the 747 went on to be the success that we all know. The four-section main landing gear was a novelty for that era, as everything else simply had two sections. Although it was designed to be able to land on just two of them in the case of a mechanical failure. I take you inside this aircraft in another video, and I'll link to that in the video description below. This went on to be an incredible success, with 1,574 built, with production ceasing in 2023, although we will keep seeing them flying for many more decades, as two are set to become the next Air Force One VIP transporters. Next we look at the Antonov AN-2 Annie, although its NATO codename was the Colt. This simple workhorse was developed for the Soviet Ministry of Forestry, and is the largest single-engine biplane ever produced. It had very impressive low speed and short takeoff and landing capabilities. It actually has no published stall speed, and apparently pilots could fly it at 30 miles per hour under full control. This made it ideal for operating in underdeveloped runways, and this old and simple design made it easier to repair in the middle of nowhere. Over 18,000 were built between 1947 and 2001. Next is the Boeing CH-47D Chinook which is a tandem rotor heavy lift helicopter that first flew in 1961 and is still in service. In fact, major upgrades are planned and it's due to fly beyond 2060. These were vital in Vietnam and a particular role was rescuing downed aircraft. In fact, they retrieved over 11,500 disabled aircraft during the conflict, saving over $3 billion worth of equipment. Next to that is the Grumman F-14A, a carrier-capable, supersonic, variable-sweep fighter jet that first flew in 1970. And while the US retired theirs in 2006, the Iranian Air Force still fly them, which they purchased when they were still friendly with the USA. But due to sanctions, they can't get any spare parts, so all of these F-14s in museums are closely monitored to ensure Iranian spies don't come and swipe some components. These were built around an advanced AWG-9 radar and AIM-54 Phoenix missiles, which were designed to identify and destroy targets well before they could get anywhere near the carrier. Next is a Grumman EA-6B Prowler, which was an electronic warfare aircraft based on the A6 that you'll see next. This has a crew of one pilot and three ECM officers who operate the electronic countermeasure equipment. These were designed to fly with and protect the attack group by taking out enemy radars by confusing them, and also by firing anti-radiation missiles at them. There was so much radiation emitted from them that the windows are lined with gold to protect their own crew. These flew until 2019 and were replaced by the EA-18G Growler. This is the Grumman A6E Intruder, which was an all-weather, carrier-capable attack aircraft which replaced the piston-engine Douglas A1 Sky Raider. This could carry a whole array of weapons and even nuclear bombs. These flew from 1960 until 1997 and operated by both the US Navy and the Marine Corps. This good looking bird is a British built AV-8C Harrier which was the first vertical and or short takeoff and landing attack aircraft and operated by the US Marines. While originally designed as a strike aircraft, it was a decent air-to-air -air fighter as we saw in the Falklands. Next is the Douglas A4F Skyhawk, which was a subsonic carrier-capable light attack aircraft that first flew in 1969 and flown by many nations, including Australia, for their HMAS Melbourne aircraft carrier. Now its wings did not fold like many other Navy fighters, but this was so small that it didn't matter. Now it is hard to tell on a video like this, but it is considerably smaller than something like the F-4 Phantom II, which it shared the aircraft carrier decks with. This aircraft flew in Southeast Asia, and then in 1980 was transferred to the Blue Angels display team, hence the paint. Moving back in time, and we have the Grumman F9 F8 Cougar. This was a major upgrade on the straight wing F9F Panther, which was found to be deficient in the Korean War when compared with the swept wing MiG-15 that we saw earlier. But this was developed in late 1952, so too late for the Korean War. 
This example was built at Grumman's Bethpage factory in New York and delivered to the US Navy on January 25, 1955. Jumping over to the civilian aircraft again, and we have the Boeing 727, and in particular this guy, D.B. Cooper. He famously hijacked a 727 and then jumped out of the rear stairs in flight and was never seen again. Afterwards, Boeing modified the rear stairs so that they couldn't open mid-flight. This aircraft itself had three rear-mounted engines and solved the problem of airlines complaining that the four-engine 707 was too thirsty, but then they also needed more than two engines to fly safely long distances over water. Moving the engines away from the wings kept those clear and slippery to provide great low-speed performance, allowing it to operate at regional airports and keeping the engines up and away from the ground and also keeping them away from foreign bodies that could be sucked in and damage them. This actual aircraft was the first one ever built and first flew in 1963. After the test program was completed, it was flown by United Airlines flying passengers. Now I did mention that the rear positioned engines kept them away from foreign bodies, but one problem they discovered was that the nose wheel could kick up water that would fly along the side of the fuselage and then could be ingested. So they installed these unique nose wheels with a ridge on the sides so that they would direct the water out at a tighter angle and not along the side of the fuselage. These were mostly replaced by more efficient 737s and A320s and those just had two engines each. Now next we have a really rare aircraft which is not a Douglas DC-3 but it's the predecessor the DC-2. One of the major differences which you can see in this example is the sides of the fuselage that are straight rather than the rounded fuselage you see on the DC-3 and everything newer. These were not pressurised, so at that stage no one realised the stress spreading benefits of rounded fuselages. This aircraft exists because United Airlines was given exclusive rights to the Boeing 247, which is the next aircraft, so TWA went to Douglas and asked them to come up with something similar. They made the DC-1 prototype, which morphed into this aircraft, of which there were 192 built. And then this was modified into the DC-3, which was a huge success both as a civilian airliner and the military C-47. For many people, the DC-3 would have been the first aircraft they'd ever seen, and this is powered by two Wright Cyclone 9-cylinder air-cooled radial piston engines, producing around 775 horsepower each. Fokker actually bought the rights to make these in Europe, but that didn't eventuate, so they were shipped over the Atlantic Ocean with the wings and the propellers detached. Nakajima in Japan also bought rights to build them and actually built five of them on the Japanese mainland. While this was a decent plane, it was overshadowed by the DC-3, which I have explored in another video. Let's spin around and have a look at the direct competitor, the Boeing 247, which is an extremely rare, so we are lucky to see it here in the metal. This one was one of the first airliners to use an all-metal construction, a retractable landing gear and a fully cantilevered wing. Prior to this, wing designs would have had bracings and wires which all created drag, but this was strong enough to simply project out of the side of the fuselage. An interesting feature of this is the windscreen, which is angled forwards, unlike every other aft swept windscreen. The reason for this was because they discovered that aft swept windows would reflect the instruments at night, but then the problem with this was that it ended up reflecting the ground lights instead and obviously increasing drag a little. With the 247D model, the windscreen was sloped backwards and they resolved the reflecting problem by installing a simple glare screen over the control panel inside. These carried 10 passengers, which seems like very little when you see how many they've squeezed into modern planes these days. As I mentioned just before, it was Boeing being sneaky and signing an exclusive contract with United that led at TWA to ask Douglas to make this competitor. If Boeing had shared these with TWA, then they might have sold a lot more. As so happens, the Douglas attempt at a modern, well for that time, airliner was far more successful. In fact, Boeing only ever made 75 of these and the primary user ended up being Boeing's own air transport service. Jumping well forward in time and we have the British Airways Concorde. Looking at these Rolls-Royce Smegma Olympus turbojets, and it's interesting to note that they use turbojets on these even though everyone else was moving to more efficient and powerful turbofans. Now the reason was that turbojets are physically quite a lot smaller, therefore in the instance of an engine failure they would create a lot less dead weight and drag than a large turbofan would. 
Of interest, the Soviet copy TU-144 did use much larger turbofans, and I suspect their greater drag contributed to their inferior fuel consumption and performance. It's a really stunning looking aircraft, and you don't realise how narrow the fuselage is until you see it in the metal. I go inside a Concorde in another video, and it's really surprising how cramped it all was especially when it's promoted as a far more expensive and luxurious option. It had these arguable delta wings, which are like a triangle, but with that indent along the leading edge, changing the angle slightly. These wings created brilliant high-speed performance, but did not produce much lift at low speed, therefore they had to compensate with extra speed and a high angle of attack. This means that the nose had to rise high in the air for the wings to produce any lift, and because of this, the tail could strike the ground, so the whole plane was lifted further up, hence why the landing gears are so long. Again, you don't realise how tall Concorde is until you see it in the metal. 20 of these were built and flown by Air France and BA, although sadly, they were retired in 2003. People do lament the fact that newer airliners were much slower, and that's true they are, but the passenger comfort offered in newer jets is in a completely different league. Concorde would be fun to fly in once, but otherwise, something like a 787 or an A380, or even a 747 from the same era, is a much more comfortable way to travel. Next is a very special aircraft, both because it operated as Air Force One, and because it's a modified Boeing 707, which revolutionised civil aviation. This Air Force VIP transporter is a VC-137A and called SAM-970. From the moment the manufacturing process begins to ongoing maintenance, all staff members work in a buddy system to ensure that no one is left alone with the aircraft to ensure there's no tampering. If you look behind the engine pile in here, you'll notice this pod that no other 707s have, and this is a somewhat still classified missile defense system. This aircraft flew Eisenhower, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, JFK, Lyndon Johnson, Kissinger, and President Nixon. In 1970 and 71, this aircraft and SAM-26000 flew Kissinger to secret meetings with North Korean officials in Paris, but to avoid being seen, they would land elsewhere and then use an unmarked jet that would fly him to Paris. His cover was almost blown in 1970 when this aircraft developed hydraulic problems and had to land at a large German airport. They quickly borrowed the French president's jet, so he was able to still attend the meeting on time. After the arrival of newer jets, this took a backseat and operated as a reserve jet and flew other dignitaries such as Kissinger as I mentioned earlier. The Boeing B-52 Stratofortress first flew in 1952 and was developed as a strategic long-range high-altitude nuclear bomber. But as advances in radar and surface-to-air missiles took place, it changed to a low-altitude penetration role where it could fly underneath enemy radars, and those bulges under the nose, which had infrared cameras and other sensors, were used to fly between mountains even at night. It famously had those eight Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojets, although you'll probably remember the photos of the black smoke, which was due to the water injection, which was common for that era. The idea was that by spraying in water adds to the mass being accelerated out, thus increasing the thrust. It also cools the turbines, allowing the engines to run at higher speed without the risk of overheating. Boeing have recently announced that they are upgrading the engines to Rolls-Royce, but assembled in the USA, F-130 turbofans, and upgraded electronics. It's been designated the B-52J, and it's expected to serve with the USAF until 2050, giving the aircraft an incredible lifespan of 100 years. In addition to nuclear bombs, it can carry conventional bombs, air-launched missiles, and this was even used to launch the X-15 and the D-21 drone I mentioned earlier. We'll look at the space collection together at the end, so let's move back across the road and explore the J. Elroy McCall Personal Courage Wing, and first, the World War I aircraft. This is the world's first fighter, the Italian Caproni CA-20 from 1914, and this is the only one that was ever made. It's a derivative of the CA-18, which was the first Italian-made plane used by the military, although it had a reconnaissance role. This was the fighter version with a forward-facing 303 Lewis machine gun up above the propeller arc. It also had a large engine for performance and to help carry the extra weight from the guns and ammunition a shorter wingspan, and a streamlined metal cowling to reduce the drag. During testing, it demonstrated great performance, but the military wanted Caproni to concentrate on heavy bombers instead, so this was the only one ever made. 
Next we have the British Royal Aircraft Factory SE5. Over 5,000 of these were built from 1916 and they were considered to be one of the fastest aircraft of World War I and also very maneuverable. Those and the Sopwith Camels were instrumental in providing the Allies air superiority. Next is a Sopwith triplane produced from 1916. The advantage of these over the biplanes was a much faster climb rate and maneuverability. The cord, which is the length between the wing's leading and trailing edge, was considerably less, therefore they obstructed less of the pilot's view, even though there was an extra wing. With time, these became less common as engines became more powerful, making monoplanes just as versatile and less complex to manufacture. The single pilot on these carried a 303 Vickers machine gun. Spinning around is a Sopwith Pup, which was extremely small, light and agile, and was the first aircraft landed on a moving ship in 1917 by Edwin Harris Dunning. These were also fitted with hydraulic synchronizing equipment that enabled the Vickers machine gun to fire through the propeller, making it easier to aim than fighters with the gun attached to the roof. These were eventually outclassed by newer German fighters and they were relegated to a home defense and training role. Now next is a very rare original Austrian Avitac D1 from 1917. The Astro Daimler six-cylinder engine initially used two side-mounted radiators, but they were not sufficient, so a much larger radiator was added to the nose, giving it the unique appearance. The fuselage was narrow, and the pilot sat up quite high, offering great visibility. It had two 8mm machine guns, and considered to have great flying and climbing characteristics. Up here is a Fokker DR1 reproduction, and these were made in response to the British Sopwith triplane. While they weren't especially fast, they were extremely maneuverable. They were made famous by German aces such as Manfred von Richthofen, also known as the Red Baron, who flew one of these even when the rest of his squadron had moved to more modern fighters. They had two 7.9mm machine guns firing through the propeller arc. This is an Albatross DVA reproduction, and while it looks beautiful, it was outdated by the time it was introduced. In fact, the Red Baron famously stated that the DV is so outdated that one does not risk anything with it. Pilots were instructed to avoid diving too steeply because the wings would flutter, potentially leading to structural failures. Up on the roof is the French Newport Type 27 from 1917, which appeared towards the end of the First World War. In an act of protest at French pilots being forced to march rather than fly at the French Victory Parade, Charles Grodefroy flew one of these through the 47.6 feet gap between the pillars at the Arc de Triomphe, making for an impressive photo. What's interesting about this French Newport Type 24 BIS are the wings where you'll notice the lower one is significantly smaller than the upper wings. And this is called sesquiplanes. And the idea was that these would maintain most of the advantages of a biplane, but have less drag and weight. Next up is the Newport 28, which interestingly was rejected by the French Air Service, but the Americans were desperate, so this is the first plane the US Army flew in combat. Famous American ace Eddie Rickenbacker flew one of these in his 26 victories, although he was almost killed when the upper wing fabric on his 28 tore apart. 26th President Theodore Roosevelt's son Quinton was sadly killed flying one of these. Next is the V8-powered SPAD-13, of which 8,000 were built and flew for the French, the Brits, and the US Army Air Service. It was considered to be one of the fastest and deadliest of all World War I fighters. Next up is one of America's most famous planes, the Curtis J. N. Jenny. Over 6,800 were built, and while they started life as a military trainer, it continued after World War I in a civilian role. In fact, it was this aircraft type that flew the first US air mail service. Up on the roof is a Sopwith Snipe, which replaced the Camel and designed around the new 230 horsepower Bentley BR2 rotary engine. These weren't as fast as the Camel, but superior in many other aspects, but came towards the end of the war and were only flown by three squadrons, 
two British and one Australian. On October 27, 1918, Canadian ace Major William Barker engaged 15 Fokkers, taking down three and still being able to escape, resulting in him being awarded a Victoria Cross. Against the wall is a Fokker D8, which was a monoplane introduced in the last few months of World War I. Development started by removing the lower wing from the Fokker D7, and it was quickly pushed into production. There were early structural problems with the wings, but once those were rectified, it proved itself to have great visibility and performance, but otherwise arrived too late to have any major influence on the wall. Next up is the World War II section, and we'll start with the German Messerschmitt BF-109E. Over 33,000 of these were built from 1935 and first used in the Spanish Civil War, giving German pilots experience prior to the outbreak of World War II. It was one of the first fighters with an all-metal monocoque construction, retractable landing gear and a closed canopy. Initially designed as an interceptor, it was later modified to operate as a bomber escort, fighter bomber, or weather fighter, ground attack, and also an aerial reconnaissance aircraft. Production continued right up until 1945 when the war ended. Opposite is the British-built Supermarine Spitfire, which first flew a year later than the BF-109 in 1936. In fact, it's the only British fighter built throughout the entire World War II, and it remains popular with enthusiasts, with many still airworthy and flying around the world. Its distinctive elliptical wing with innovative sunken rivets gave it great performance, although the engine lacked initially. This one is an LF Mark IX, and the major upgrade was the Merlin 66 engine. Prior to this, Spitfires were struggling when compared with the FW190, so the new engine was vital. This is a Curtis P40N Warhawk, and what's most interesting is the paint. These were flown by the first American volunteer group of the Republic of China Air Force, which operated these P-40s with Chinese colors. Their role was to support the Chinese in their fight with the Japanese. These American volunteers were all officially members of the Chinese Air Force and paid roughly three times as much than if they were working for the US. They had three fighter squadrons of around 30 aircraft each, and in 1992, these veterans were retroactively recognized as members of the US military services during their seven months of combat with the Japanese. Next is a Japanese Nakajima Ki-43 Hayabusa. 5,900 of these were built, making it Japan's most widely built aircraft of the war, and it was considered to be one of the most maneuverable on either side. But its poor offensive firepower and armor proved increasingly problematic from 1943 onwards. It was powered by a 14-cylinder engine, producing 1,190 horsepower. Back with the Allies, and we have the General Motors FM2 Wildcat. Designed by Grumman in 1939, this was one of the most capable Navy fighters during the Battle of Midway and Coral Sea. While this wasn't as fast nor maneuverable as the Japanese Zero, American pilots compensated with more advanced tactics. Grumman suspended production of this in 1943 and focused on the F-6F Hellcat, although this one was assembled under license by General Motors Eastern Aircraft Division. This aircraft came with the more powerful 9-cylinder Radial Wright Cyclone R-1820-56 engine. Another naval fighter was this Goodyear FG-1D Corsair which was actually the most produced carrier fighter of all time and considered to be the premier navy and marine fighter of World War II. To meet the military's demands, they were built by Corsair, Goodyear and Brewster. The goal was to design a plane around this massive engine, so to avoid a long landing gear to keep the 13-foot props off the runway, they used this bent wing design which also had the unexpected benefit of reduced drag, but the long and large nose did reduce the pilot's visibility. Down here is a cutaway of that massive engine, the Pratt & Whitney R28000, and you can see the two rows of radial cylinders, allowing this to fit all 18 of them in. They displaced 2,800 cubic inches, and they were used in the Corsair among many other aircraft. Next is the Republic P-47D Thunderbolt, which uses the same engine. This was designed as a high-altitude fighter, but was found to be great close to the ground in a fighter-bomber and ground-attack role. The armoured cockpit kept the pilot safe, while the eight 50 cal machine guns and 2,500 pounds of bombs or rockets destroyed enemy ground troops and equipment. When loaded, it could weigh up to 8 tonnes, making it one of the heaviest fighters of the war. 
After World War II, the Chinese Nationalist Air Force used 102 of these against communist forces during their civil war. Next is the Yakolev Yak-9U fighter used by the Soviets during World War II and the North Koreans during the Korean War. Over 16,000 of this model type were built and they had a single 20mm cannon firing through the propeller spinner which was useful against tanks. And they had two 50 cal machine guns in the fuselage as well. The U model had an upgraded and more powerful M107A engine, so the arrival of these at the Battle of Kursk was vital in giving Soviet pilots parity with the German BF-109 and Focke-Wulf 190s. Next is a North American P-51D Mustang. This came about in response to an urgent request by the British for a new fighter, and 102 days after the contract was signed, this first flew on the 26th of October 1940. It originally came with an Allison V1710 engine with a single stage supercharger where power dropped off above 15,000 feet, so the Brits replaced it with a Rolls Royce Merlin 65 which dramatically improved its performance. This American designed and British powered fighter went on to be hugely successful and over 15,000 were built and it wasn't retired from military service until 1984 in the Dominican Republic. This up here is a Lockheed P-38L Lightning. Around 10,000 of these single-engine, twin-engine fighters were built, and it was the first American fighter jet to reach 400 miles per hour in level flight. Two Allison 12-cylinder engines generated the power, and by moving them onto the wings, the nose was kept free for the cannons and gun. Interestingly, the two props turned in the opposite direction to neutralize the engine torque, and the tricycle landing gear was novel for that era. And here we are looking at the P-51's tail again. In addition to the increased power, mating the Merlin engine with the P-51's frame also improved fuel economy, therefore they created a fighter with a long enough range to escort heavy bombers all the way from the UK to Berlin and back. Now let's check out the space gallery. We'll come back to this space shuttle orbiter trainer shortly and start with this full-size model of the Mars Rover Sojourner. This was the first vehicle to drive on Mars after landing there in 1997, around 20 years after the Viking lander, which was the first to transmit data back from Mars' surface. This spent 83 days taking photos and sending data back to Earth about its weather and the chemical composition of the surface. This is the full fuselage trainer, or the FFT, and is a full-scale mock-up of the NASA Space Shuttle Orbiter without the wing and used for crew training. With this they would gain familiarity with it, practice emergencies and how to operate its many systems. This was located at the Johnson Space Center and is the oldest one that they had built back in the 1970s. I show you around a real shuttle in another video which includes footage from DC and Houston and I'll link to that video below. Let's walk up and have a look inside the payload bay which could carry up to 65,000 pounds of equipment although they'd need to get rid of at least half of that prior to re-entry as to not muck up its re-entry and glide to the runway. Here on the left is a remote control robot arm called the Canadarm, used to move equipment and even astronauts around the cargo hold and into space. Up above is a Boeing inertial upper stage mock-up which was an autonomous rocket booster which could be launched from Earth by a Titan IV or launched from inside the spatial orbiter. Once removed from the shuttle payload bay and at a safe distance, it would activate the rocket and put whatever they wanted, usually defense or communication satellite, into the desired orbit. Here you have an external airlock and an orbital docking system. Inside here, crew could get in their spacesuit and either enter space or move up into the International Space Station. Here's an image of the orbiter attached to the Russian satellite Mir in 1995. A space lab could also be positioned in here. In fact, you can see it in the same photo and crew could use the additional space for their experiments. Let's continue the tour and move on to the Russian and previously the Soviet Union's primary crew vehicle since the 1960s, the Soyuz TMA-14 descent module. These are one of three modules that make up the Soyuz spacecraft and seats up to three cosmonauts or astronauts. And this is the only part that survives the atmospheric re-entry. 
It has a large parachute and a solid fuel rocket that fires 1.5 meters just before touchdown to cushion the impact. This module visited the ISS in 2009. Back over near the Great Gallery is more space equipment. First up is the model Sputnik 1, which was the world's first artificial satellite ever launched into space. The Soviets used an intercontinental ballistic missile on October 4th, 1957 to launch it and it circumnavigated the world with a simple beeping sound announcing the Soviet success. It's incredible that such a small object was able to put so much fear in the US government at the time. This is a Rocketdyne F1 engine, and five of these were used on the Saturn V rocket. It was the most powerful single nozzle liquid fueled rocket ever flown, and they burned nearly three tons of kerosene and liquid oxygen every second as they produced 1.5 million pounds of thrust each. And these are what those engines look like after they've been used and fallen back into the ocean. The lower object was the Apollo 12 engine number no. 3's thrust chamber, and here's what it would look like prior to launch. With the object above that being the gas generator and the heat exchanger from Apollo 16, and again what it would look like prior to being exposed to a huge amount of heat. Next is an engineering model Apollo lunar roving vehicle used in the final three Apollo moon landings which allowed them to explore further away from their own module. These electric powered vehicles could carry two astronauts and their supplies for up to six miles away from the lunar module because that was the distance they decided that they could walk back from if the vehicle broke down. These were folded up and attached to the descent stage of the lunar module and here's photos from NASA of it in different stages of being folded. Once landed, the crew could pull a pin and it would unfold itself in 15 minutes and was ready to drive. This here, and looking initially from the outside, is the William E. Boeing Red Barn. It was this all wooden barn built in 1909 where Boeing first built planes. It was abandoned by Boeing during World War II, but purchased by the museum for $1 and barged two miles to its current location to be put on display. After being restored, it was opened to the public in 1983. Downstairs they've recreated the workshop where they would make their own wooden components with equipment powered by pulleys from the roof. You can just imagine that the noise would have been deafening and a nightmare for any OHS fire manager as the whole place looks like it's made of kindling. Here's a plan in the very early stages of assembly and it really highlights just how basic the design was. With such primitive engines of that era, there wasn't a lot of power, therefore everything had to be as light as possible, hence why fabric skin was so popular and any important structural component was made as thin as possible. They have a scale model of the Boeing's first plant, and you can actually make out the red barn in the centre of it. It was positioned right next to a river, as this allowed for the wood and other materials to arrive easily on barges. Now upstairs was a display moving through Boeing's history, and while it was fascinating, it was difficult to put it into a video like this, so you'll have to visit it yourself. This brings to an end this guided tour around this incredible museum of flight here in Seattle. Apologies if I missed something that you were looking for, and if so, please let me know in the comments below as I'm sure to visit again. If you enjoyed this, please comment so I know to keep making these videos, and please check out my channel for many other similar guided tours. I've recently posted videos taking you around the Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport and the National Museum of the USAF in Dayton, Ohio. Thanks for watching.